We are here this morning with Sonia Nieto. Uh, Sonia is an, a luminary in multicultural education. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn and ask Sonia to please speak to the past, present, and future of multicultural education. You know, I took my first course in multicultural education in 1975 when I started my doctoral studies. And so it is not, as you know, a new field. It's really been around for quite a while, but it's evolved over the years. My first course was with uh, uh, Professor Bob Suzuki, who was a wonderful teacher and mentor and scholar, and wrote some of the seminal pieces in multicultural education before he became a college president. And then, you know, he didn't have time for any of that anymore. But, um, you know, his, his courses really, um, sort of put into words for me what I had been thinking about and doing as a classroom teacher and what I held dear, you know, the values that I held dear. I was very fortunate in uh, beginning my studies with Bob because he had a very critical um, understanding of multicultural education, which I don't think uh, was widespread at the time. And he understood that, uh, although he didn't use the word sociopolitical context or the words, that, that, that uh, multicultural education is embedded within a particular context and that you need to be aware of that context. Um, so I think when it started, which was in the early 70s, and some of our, you know, luminaries indeed, started it, like Jim Banks, Geneva Gay, Carl Grant, when the very beginnings of it, and then Christine Sleater, um, that they, they also, you know, had that critical perspective, but that uh, when it was translated into classroom practice, that wasn't always the case. And it's unfortunate that that's still the case, although I think it's getting better. I think that more and more people are becoming aware of the uh, the necessity of understanding multicultural education in a broader way. Uh, one way in which it's changed dramatically from the beginning is that uh, it's become much more inclusive. And so at the beginning, because uh, multicultural education emerged from the civil rights movement and was really um, about and centered on African-American students, um, that was the focus. It was on race and culture and ethnicity, uh, as it should have been, because the, you know, the African-Americans uh, uh, in the civil rights movement and their allies were really focused on a group that had been so um, uh, oppressed through education and, and many other ways that that became the focus, as it should have been. And from that civil rights movement emerged other very important uh, movements as well, like the women's movement and uh, multicultural education and bilingual education and disability rights and gender rights and uh, uh, gender identity and you know, so many disability rights, if I didn't say that, so many things. And so whereas 30 years ago or 40 years ago, these were not necessarily included in multicultural education. I think that nowadays most scholars and practitioners in the field recognize that it needs to be an inclusive movement uh, because when, when any one person is oppressed, all of us are. And uh, so that's a, a huge change. I think another change has been uh, the, um, the understanding that power and privilege are really uh, at the root of multicultural education. That is, who has power, how is it used, uh, how is it misused, who benefits uh, and who loses, which are Paulo Freire's uh, uh, questions, which are so important to keep in mind. Who benefits and who loses from particular uh, practices and policies uh, in education and outside of education as well. And so that understanding of power as being 
uh, an important part of multicultural education is also, I think, a you know, something that is uh, that has uh, developed over the years. Um, in terms of the future of multicultural education, I mean, clearly, our society has changed tremendously in the past half century. Uh, by 2042, the majority of people in the United States will be people of color, and that alone won't change things. Um, look at the case of South Africa, for example. Um, but it will make a difference. Um, you know, I look forward to the day when we no longer have to say the word multicultural, and we can just say education, and that it will include everybody. Until that time, I think we need to say multicultural education. Um, so, you know, if when diversity of all kinds uh, is accepted, in education and beyond, then I think we can just say it's good education. Uh, right now we're in process. I think that uh, a huge change, not just in the field of multicultural education, but in, uh, in education in general, has been the standardization movement and the high-stakes testing movement, because in so many cases I hear teachers say, you know, I'd really like to do more in terms of, you know, inclusiveness of curriculum and so on, but I just can't do it because we have so much pressure to teach to the test. And so I think that's a terrible uh, uh, burden uh, that teachers and administrators both have to deal with. Um, and so I think it has put a, a real constraint on multicultural education, but I also want to say that I don't think that it has to. But I think sometimes uh, those constraints are, yes, they're real, of course, but that we can always do more than what we think we can do. And so I always encourage the teachers who I've worked with to think about pushing the envelope. How do you push the envelope even in these high stakes times, even in these times of rigid standardization? Uh, and we can do a lot. Um, I'm hoping that in the next few years there will be a lessening of the standardization, uh, but that will only happen if people really organize and, right. and struggle for change, because otherwise, you know, we're in this corporatization and marketization of education that I think is, um, it, is not for the good, you know, it's not for the common good. Uh, and so. You know, for, for example, recently I visited an independent school uh, that I was so impressed with because not only were the class sizes small, you know, up to 15 in each class, uh, there was a diversity of, of faculty and of students. Uh, they had acres of land and, and, and several buildings, uh, but the entire school was infused with art. I just felt really wonderful about that school but at the same time that I felt really sad for so many kids who don't have that experience. You know, where they have all these art teachers who are full-time teachers on the staff and there are schools in urban and rural areas as well where they don't even have art anymore. Not to mention social studies and, and recess and so many things that are essential for you know, a really great education. And so while some privileged kids get that kind of education, most kids do not. Uh, privileged because they go into those schools, not because they happen to be wealthy. Some are, of course, many are, but some are not. And, um, but because of scholarships and so on, they're able to receive that kind of education. Everybody should get that kind of education. And the school was incredibly multicultural because when you include the arts, of course you're necessarily multicultural, but when you include anything, you know, the entire curriculum was really multicultural. That's what education should be about. So, you know, it, it concerns me that we have the standardization movement that isn't, 
allowing for people to think in more creative ways about how to include a multicultural perspective in their teaching. Mm -hmm. In terms of the theory of multicultural education, I think it's expanded a great deal and it's exciting to see many um, young scholars uh, entering the field. It's exciting to see teachers who have been uh, exposed to a multicultural perspective in their teacher education programs go out into the field and you know tackle uh, these issues that that uh, heretofore many teachers were very reluctant to even speak about issues of privilege and you know and power mm -hmm. uh, and I see young teachers who have had the benefit of a multicultural education themselves being much more uh, comfortable mm -hmm. with these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Which is not to say that old teachers can't right. learn, of course, because, you know, here I am, uh, and we're all learning all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that is a hopeful sign. But, you know, it's sort of two competing um, tendencies in multicultural education or in education right now. One is the standardization and one is the, you know, sort of the organizing against that. Uh, and when you organized against that, I think that, you know, everybody who is organizing against that standardization and high stakes and so on, uh, almost everybody, is also a multiculturalist at heart. Because they understand that without an inclusive education, we lose many kids along the way. You know, I asked uh, Gary uh, Howard not too long ago in a conversation that we were having about just the dilemma that all of our schools aren't teaching a multicultural curriculum. And I said, what would it take, Gary, to you know make a change nationally? We see these isolated, wonderful schools, but you know, when is it going to be that we'll have a national reflection and curriculum? And he said, you know, Karen, it may take teachers to, to protest, yeah. to have a revolution yeah. on what education would be. And he kind of smiled about that, but I took it very seriously. It, it may just take that mm -hmm. um, yeah. to really see the type of transformation that we've been mm -hmm. talking about for years. You've written so many books, Sonia, and one I know that um, both nationally and internationally that's used in college classrooms is affirming diversity and looking at the social political issues in that. And I think. Um, some of the principles or characteristics that you share with, about multicultural education have really, really stuck with me over the years when I think about multicultural education being a process, uh, being critical pedagogy, being for all students, being anti-racist. Uh, and I know that for each edition that you've had, you've kept those characteristics there, um, but you've also built on them. Um, can you just speak a little bit to the book for our um, well, our readers, but now they actually have an opportunity to um, tune in to us by way of the internet through the blog now. And if you could just share a little bit, I know that our uh, readers slash visual audience might like to hear you just say a few words about affirming diversity and how that should be used in the in the 21st classroom, mm -hmm. our 21st century classroom today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, well, you probably remember the first edition of Affirm Diversity came out in 1992, and you were already a student in the program, I think, or you were just starting. Yeah, I was teaching and using that book. Yes, right, that's right. That was the first edition. And so, uh, yeah, it has gone through a, a number of iterations. It's now in its sixth edition, and both the fifth and the sixth editions are with my co-author, Patty Bodie, um, who is a visual artist, and I think that's no that is no accident, you know, that she brings that kind of, uh, as you do, that kind of, of knowledge and intelligence to, to the work that, uh, that she does. Um, and so some of the ways that it's changed over the years is that we've included more case studies of different kinds of uh, kids from different backgrounds, although from the beginning I insisted that when we have case studies that we include a variety of kids because so often people thought that multicultural education was for African-American and Latino kids. 
and maybe not even for Latino kids. Maybe bilingual education was for Latino kids and multicultural <laughs> education was for African-American kids. And I wanted to make it clear from the very beginning that it's for everybody.